into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. PDA Sports, getting the fucking shit. Um, it's in the pod. Yeah, it's started. I don't know. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. It's a sports episode. We're do- boldly choosing to do an episode pre Super Bowl this year. Are you ready for some podcast? Yeah, it's like a, one of those deep fried country songs. Are you ready for some fucking podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember lazy. the uh, fuck Hank? Hank uh, was it Hank Williams? No, not Hank Williams. The dude who did the Monday Night Football, the Monday Night, and it turned out he was like a huge, yeah. You got fired for being racist. Yeah, yeah. He was like extreme, like today's you know basic Republican, but right. uh, yeah. too early. <laughs> Monday night, it's the night for whites getting out and taking the country. <laughs> Did you hear about this other guy that had just like this week, this Morgan Wallen guy who uh, he got dropped from like his record yeah. label or the he was going to host the AMC Awards or something because uh, there's a clip of him saying the N word and then his sales went up 339 <laughs> percent. That's called being canceled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We made him into a fucking millionaire. Anyways. Hi, I'm Jake. Incredible. Um, quarterback of the show, Alex Patak Ooh. is here. Hey, everybody, it's a turnover on downs. <laughs> Anders <laughs> Lee, the goalie, he's playing hockey. Uh, oh, true. Um, I, I'm a wing, they they don't have wing ends. Do they have ends in hockey? Doesn't have yeah, to make Anders sense. is a tight end. <laughs> I mean, that's, what, that's what my dad was. Anders Lee here, tight end, backup quarterback, free safety. Uh, but joining us, uh, I guess you'd be referee in this metaphor, Arif Hassan. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> yeah, dude, why not? Yeah, sports <laughs> podcasts will often invite on a referee just to make sure nothing gets out of hand. <laughs> yeah. I want an interview a ref so bad. I bet they have like a vow of silence that they can't do interviews, but that would be so much <laughs> fun not, to get like they're a not ref what? drunk. What? They're not priests. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they can't like admit to bias and stuff. Like they, they would be scared to like s- let something slip. Like they don't like a certain player or something. Uh, it would like, be so. Like, if you were gonna Serpico a referee, you're saying you'd be so cool if yeah. you had to. If you wanted to talk to a ref, you had to go to like the ref temple in the middle of some weird. <laughs> village that's all like, like take off your shoes you know, wear, they all like, live together in like a <laughs> yeah molecule. they're all praying to a bigger ref yeah there's like a stained glass window of a fucking referee saint well speaking of windows there has been a problem that i mean i, I know this has happened at least once in uh, 2006 the afc yeah. uh championship there's a ref who made a really bad call it was like i forget what it was it was like uh he picked no way he called pass interference <laughs> but a really, really bad one that affected the outcome of uh, Patriots Colts game. Does he have there. to get his eyes checked? Uh, no, he has to get his uh, ego checked by the <laughs> angry fans who threw a brick through his window. Uh, that's happened at least once. Only in sports. Have you ever seen? <laughs> did you see say. the referee <laughs> yeah. episode of uh, How to with John Wilson? He's, no, that sounds yeah. dope. It's awesome. He goes it's to a referee a, convention. He goes to a, like a referee like me- meeting. They have like a they're all part of some organization where they have to meet and stuff. But they have like a dinner with like a raffle and all this shit. And like the guy, the head ref that's like organizing the whole dinner is like he, the, it's chaos the whole time. He's like one hamburger per plate. I know I could see you. You need to bust your tables after you're done. And it's crazy because it's like <laughs> their whole life is rules. So I guess that they don't fucking follow them in their off time or something. <laughs> like, you see, did you see that Ted talk where a lawyer was like, Hey, this is how to use a menu at a restaurant. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's wild. He's like, yeah. So, 
uh, being a lawyer is all about kind of, you know, navigating the rules and using them to your advantage. And I was like, well, I mean, you say it out loud. That's great. Uh, and, and, and menus are, are a set of implied rules. And I was like, yeah, I, I get it. This feels like a stretch. And he just goes on to talk about like this insane pizza restaurant, uh, which I would like to call a pizzeria, but it, it feels like it's giving it too much credit that like yells at you for doing stuff wrong. And he's like, yeah, I've never had a problem at this restaurant because I followed the rules uh, and it's my favorite restaurant. And I was like, oh, of course it would be. It yells at you for getting stuff wrong. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> there is. Anyway, it's a whole Ted talk. That's wow. insane. There are referees are authoritarians. They need, they need to be like put in place. That's a problem with that scene. They have to wait until the whistle comes out. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's uh yeah, we, we should definitely make political analogies with sports all the time. And referees are certainly the Stalins of the, of the world. <laughs> well, there is a place in Ridgewood that's just called a referee store. And it, like, sells referee gear, I guess. But It's not like a parody footlocker because that would be hilarious. <laughs> no, it's it's a front, <laughs> what it is. I'm 100% <laughs> sure this is a front for the mob. It's, like, closed all the time. They have this weird, like emblem with a whistle and like two ferns under it dude uh, it's a hundred percent like it's where you to go oh yeah there's some no. sort of trafficking ring happening yeah no there. the fucking that's where john wilson goes in the episode of that show Oh, really yeah he goes what? to the fucking referee <laughs> store and I, it's i'm real? starting to think that andrews is like doing guerrilla marketing for this <laughs> hbo show that came out three months ago it's he goes to the referee store and there's like different whistles on the wall and shit for them to like look at and go oh, you know this one's got a grip on it or whatever. I mean, it still might be a front, but he goes to it in it the show. It absolutely is. Huh. <laughs> what ethnic- Ima- imagine the dedication of holding your front to create different models of whistles with different features, though. I mean, you kind of just have to hand it to them at that point. I think it's one of those yeah, things where it's good. like the, it's a mob family and they have one son who's like a soft, like he can't go into. Oh, yeah. So he's like uh, really into the, the, yeah. the store. Yeah. Oh, right. that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> if I right. What does he love? Referees. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, before we get too bogged down into sports talk, you know how we do. Your listeners of the regular show regularly, you know how we can't stop gabbing about the big game here on the show. Let's do a little bit of um, a little bit of a news roundup since we've been on a kick of deep dives recently. Um, to start, I don't have my two thousand fucking dollars. Do you? Uh, oh. I'm blowing the whistle. Yeah, whistle bumble. Like that's the um oh, that yellow would be a card. Great, <laughs> I'm gonna that call. That would be a great you like code pink style stunt is to get somebody as like a referee uh, to you know dress up as a ref and then like get, like throw flags at politicians for being corrupt. It's actually not a bad that, idea. That would be we should, really something. We should go to the Capitol and do that someday together. After we go to the referee store, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think you should go to the Capitol and throw stuff at the Capitol building. Uh-huh. I'm going to stay at home <laughs> and not be white here. Uh, but you can throw stuff at the Capitol all you want. <laughs> Anders, right, what you need, you need to get right. like a thousand friends who all take a trip to the referee <laughs> store together. <laughs> And it'd help if you have some disgruntled business owners with you, and then you all go together and start throwing uh, cards at the congressman. <laughs> see what happens. It would all be right. so funny if the next Capitol riot is they're all just dressed like referees, and they in the news they have no idea why. Oh, that's way funnier than the guy with like the Viking helmet and stuff. Yeah, yeah. person after person just explain to the camera, "We're referees because they're breaking the rules." So <laughs> we thought we'd be referees. That's interesting. What about you? Well, they're breaking the rules in there, so I thought <laughs> we're referees. We're all going to be referees, and they're all getting a, a timeout. I was worried what referees do. Yeah. <laughs> Arif, were you also worried that that guy would be a Vikings fan? That's what uh, yeah, mind. I was a little worried, but then I saw the tweets explaining who he was and how he's been to like so many rallies and stuff, and I was like, oh, okay, no, he's just a yeah. lunatic. Yeah, All right. he's from close Phoenix. One. Yeah, close. Uh, he's <laughs> they never overlap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anders, what are you Not saying is the news with the fucking stimmy? What's the new thing that happened? Because it, it's been whittled down to like now it's means tested. The yeah. new means testing is based on the your 2019 tax return. So if you made fifty thousand oh, really? dollars in 2019, you don't qualify for for it anymore. 
um, which sucks. is insane, by the way. The fucking uh, Freddie G, the comic, just brought this up on Twitter, and I think it's a really good point, uh, which is that they've been saying like that the the fourteen hundred dollars is supplemental to the six hundred dollars that they already gave us, which equals two thousand dollars. Which means they're not liars when they said they were going to give us two thousand dollars. That's like the whole grift or whatever of this last mm-hmm. month or whatever. But now, if they're means testing the fourteen hundred dollars. That means not everyone who got the $600 is going to get the rest of the $2,000. So this just means they were lying. I mean, like, we already knew that, but that's, like, that... that yeah. We've caught you in a math lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, Blow it's, the it's whistle. A... Penalty box. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, I mean, like, it, it's a paper-thin lie, too, right? Because, like, Biden said when he was rallying for, like, Ossoff and Warnock that you'll get a $2,000 check, which is a singular right. item. <laughs> where, like, you, that's, that's unambiguous. You get a $2,000 check right uh and it's like yeah but you know you add it together and like over time it adds up to two thousand dollars and you know you got to carry the one it's fine don't worry about it uh i I don't like i I don't know what it is with like democrats and making you do work to justify their stupid stuff like just just do the thing you say it's not hard this is the politically the easiest thing in the world to be like yeah we wanted two thousand dollar checks and the gop said no but we we have reconciliation so, so we just did it you just right. do what's it. Imp- what's impressive is their job hypothetically requires you to like them, and yet they go out <laughs> of their way to make sure that does not happen, even in the giving you free money part. <laughs> yeah, it's a stupid political move, uh, obviously. I think, you know, some of them are trying to blame it on Manchin uh, standing in the way there, but I-, I honestly think it has something to do with with Larry Summers, who they're now saying, like, oh, he's not he's not let in. The uh, the You can't sub him in. Uh, to the White House team uh, right now, but... Yeah, he got canceled, so he can't be on the team, but he wrote yeah. an op-ed. So he wrote an op-ed, cool. and he's said in interviews that the 2000 number is disconcerting to him because it will, oh, no. quote-unquote, overheat <laughs> the economy. Oh, it's Which too like, hot. All the problems with risk. our economy. No, for sure. Yeah. 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 I don't think overheating is the problem. It's, it's yeah, it's it's kind of like me being a virgin and being like, I, if I, I'm just going to have too much. Too I much don't want to have too much sex. Yeah. Yeah. You you don't want to overheat the economy. You got to keep the economy at a nice, you got to brown it and then broil <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, a nice juicy economy. <laughs> I want to get those, those lines on the economy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But something I found really disgusting, too, uh, this week was they are not only trying to means test it for income, they're also excluding undocumented people in America from getting a stimulus who are, you know, people who pay taxes, right? They're in the economy. And obviously, it's a disgusting uh, stance just from a moral perspective perspective right They're they're not not human beings just because they you know don't have citizenship but it's also a stupid economic idea too because they are a huge part of the economy right and this this goes for healthcare too when people are trying to be like well we gotta you know make sure that it only goes to citizens well there's no like germs don't stop when somebody doesn't have a green card right they don't they don't respect borders uh so you like if you want to sp- stop contagious diseases from spreading you just got to make sure everybody who lives where you live has health care like it's pretty basic uh and my way, understanding yeah. is the uh the means testing stuff is part of bipartisan outreach to the republicans to like bring the overall number down which mm-hmm. is maybe my favorite part of the whole thing because you know those guys who spend their entire careers literally sucking the blood out of poor people because they don't think they've earned it or whatever those people are concerned that the the rich are getting too much of the payments. <laughs> oh yeah, well it's like with Pete Buttigieg and like, well, I don't want to give billionaires kids free tuition. That sounds ridiculous. Why would you do that? We should only give poor people free education. It's like that literally doesn't. They're all, they already get a free ride to go. Who cares? Yeah, like you, yeah, you the free it complicated right. part. They don't want, came from doesn't the... want to raise their taxes, right? That's how you make <laughs> up for it. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, you get me. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So just like like contagion doesn't stop it, like the the virus doesn't like ask for your papers before it infects you. Mm-hmm. Uh, like economic activity does not like stop at citizenship. And uh, I mean, like you said, it they pay taxes too, and this is how they pay taxes through generating economic activity, through like sales tax and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, because they don't file with the IRS, 
they don't get a tax refund. So the stuff that gets automatically deducted from their check for whatever insane reason it gets deducted from their check. Uh, and then also all the sales tax, that, that just goes into the government's coffers. And you're reducing the capability for any of that stimulus money to generate the kind of economic activity that net results in in more tax income for the government. If that's you know a thing that they cared about, obviously they don't mm. care about it. Otherwise, they would actually like tax rich people more. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, in any way that like a stimulus is good, giving it to more people is more good. Which is <laughs> right. like I know like it's PhD level economics, but I, I hope that like people can follow along that giving people money is good. Yeah. Well, beyond even being a stimulus, like the I think we kind of just lost track of the original point of this which was to pay people to stay home, right? Yeah. Because of the fucking pandemic. So if you don't give it to everyone, especially if you don't give it to, like, people that are at work right now, like immigrants and shit, yeah. then, uh, yeah, no, the virus it don't care about your feelings, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, the virus don't care about your feelings, hombre. It's like something fucking one of those asshole Republicans is going to say on the Senate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, the, and the thing that, not that this is super surprising, but the thing that, really sucks too is you have eight democrats who are also uh trying to exclude undocumented people um including of course our friend hickenlooper uh in colorado um and one of them is another one is mark kelly from arizona who's supposed to be you know this great uh savior uh for the democratic party right his wife got shot he's an astronaut you know great pitch uh, All the requirements. <laughs> yeah. But he's part of the political sort of machine, or, or he had been already. I'm wondering, because I was watching something recently about Larry Fitzgerald, who, of course, is a Cardinals wide receiver. And people kept saying he could be elected senator tomorrow. He's so popular in the state of Arizona. Uh, do you think it makes sense to go after athletes like that who have high, huge rate, name recognition and who might not be totally indoctrinated into like the sort of democratic leadership class uh, way of thinking is is that do you think there's well, any possibility there? Well, so so uh, a couple of thoughts. One, Larry Fitzgerald specifically is a wife beater, so that's something we got to keep in oh, mind. Oh, really? Oh, shit. yeah, right. It, like no All one right. ever talks about it, right? Ooh. Um, two, uh, I may, like I my concern with uh, with people that are not particularly vocal or involved in politics getting involved in politics is that they usually become like puppets of of whoever has the most access to them which once they get elected will be democratic leadership and so yeah. while they won't be participating in kind of like the active destruction of of the poor it would be something that they could be convinced to go along with fairly easily just because um, they're relying on others to provide them leadership. This isn't an argument that they're dumb or not or whatever, right? It's just mm -hmm. an argument that when you're outside of your comfort zone, you look to people who are helping you out to help you out, and the people that will help you out are, are the people in, in leadership. So, like, for example, if Justin Jackson was elected – um, as a Democrat somehow, which would be amazing, I would I would totally trust him to do stuff, right? Because yeah. um, he has a very coherent understanding of the way that he wants the world to work. And so he won't necessarily have to lean on somebody to tell him kind of like, you know, wh which way to vote. And he's already got an understanding of how he wants strategy to work. You know, I, I might disagree with him on the force the vote stuff. I don't mm -hmm. really care about that. So um, it's not important to me, but he has an understanding of the way like tactics work. He has an understanding of the way that he wants policies to work. So that's not an issue, but somebody who isn't actively engaging um, with politics, and that's just a worry, right? They might be thinking about it all the time and I wouldn't know. Um, like John Elway is a good example of that. Um, yeah. Right. And yeah. And, and so I would imagine that, that, you know, most people that have a high level of name recognition, but aren't actively involving themselves in the conversation, you know, could be subject to that. And, you know, I could be wrong. Alan Page is a really good example of somebody who mm -hmm. uh, wasn't necessarily super active as a political figure before he got involved um, in, in the legal system, and then eventually ran for a Supreme Court justice in Minnesota uh, and has been, you know, wonderful from that perspective yeah. as a justice. And so uh, it's not necessarily the case, but it would be my first worry is that he'd be shaped by the people um, uh, or whoever would be shaped by the people that have the most access to them at, the po at that moment. Yeah, now hear me out here for just one second. We're a podcast of men. Have we considered that maybe this argument just means that what you need is a group of influential people to get in there and do the grooming? 
Okay. Yeah. You indoctrinated the ground a tough floor. Word, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can dress it up any way you want, but at the end of the day, we're taking a handsome celebrity and we're uh, raising them to be our our, our our political lover. You know what I'm saying? Well, no, yeah, I c- go out there. They're going to carry our water. I am kind of into that idea because you could take someone like <clears throat> Sha- oh, I'm trying to think of someone who uh, is not a wife beater. Uh, we can make so Jack Black like- president. I believe that. <laughs> now, can you convince him to do like lefty policy stuff? Probably. You just have to get in there I- I now. Think it's possible. If you got before like- the DNC. If we assembled around uh, Ray Kareth, uh or someone like that. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, it's if uh, beast mode. If we got a oh, hey him. yeah yeah he seems like he's somebody Marshawn Lynch who's like cares about people he just, just seems like a good person if we if there are people in Oakland where I think he's living now who like got around him and were like this is what we want and we think you could help us with this uh, on a very like local level he could be mayor of of Oakland I can't remember if we yeah, talked about this last still- time but uh, yeah. James Harden. Had this thing happen yeah. where he wore a fucking Blue Lives Matter pl- Punisher flag mask or something in a yes. picture. Yeah, he did. And then people were like, what the fuck, James? And he was like, oh, I didn't know what it was. So <laughs> my thing is the comics. he moved. To- <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I thought well, I it mean- was a skull. I thought it was a skull. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like that's like kind of part of the, the issue, right? It, 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 that but, reveals two things. One, how insanely online we all are. Right. Like, sure. I think a ton of people just might not like get it. Like the Punisher with the thin blue line skull. Like a lot of people just be like, yeah, it's a skull. I don't really care. Yeah. Uh, and not like understand that there's like a bunch of cultural signifiers that um, people either in the, the the culture of whatever it is understand or the people who are very online and, and keep track of that stuff understand. But also, uh, too, um, yeah, I mean, you got to be aware of this stuff. Like if you're if you're going to be uh, like a. What's the word? Thought leader? C- gross. Um, but, but if you're, you're going to be one, figure. yeah, if you're going to be a public yeah. figure um, who like tries to influence policy or politics or whatever, you got to be aware of this kind of stuff, and and that's that's the worry, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, Marshawn Lynch seems like somebody that like uh, you know you surround him with with uh, people with good politics, and uh, you're probably set on a good, pretty good path. Mm-hmm. I like Marshawn a lot. Yeah, he's. Do uh, you think he's going to come back at any point, or is he's too old? Like what to like play? Yeah, some people have suggested to me that he might return to the Seahawks. Uh, I mean, no, but he would probably be the <laughs> least surprising, like, come out of nowhere guy that just runs for, like, 600 yards one season for no reason. Like, I could see it, but mm-hmm. I I don't think so. What, okay. What's interesting is that, like, when Ricky Williams came back, it's because he was, like, legally in debt to the Dolphins. Right. <laughs> and so he had to play. Um, but uh, Marshawn came back because he was just, like, kind of bored or whatever. Uh, he didn't – he has – actually, I don't think he spent any of the money that he earned in the NFL. All the money that he spent has come, like, through endorsements, which he doesn't have a ton of. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, most of the – most of the the income that he gets just, like, kind of goes back into the community in some way. But a lot of his – a lot of his salary is, like, held in escrow, so he can't touch it. But, yeah. Um, so it's kind of the opposite of the Ricky Williams situation, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, I could see Marshawn coming back for like no really particularly good reason. <laughs> Those are his two options: come back or uh, become president. Yeah, as a socialist. Um, well, while we're talking about public figures and their sort of uh, decisions to launch certain initiatives and and whatnot, <laughs> uh, David Hawk, famous for uh, the Parkland. Shooting, not committing, but that's his credit. That, the that's a, that's a good shooting. clarification. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is true that like since Columbine, there has been, I think, a pretty effective effort on the one of the very few th- good things the media has done over the past like twenty, thirty years is like they don't um, emphasize the shooter anymore. They talk about the victims, uh, which gives the victims clout to do. Things we uh, like, things, you know, that maybe we don't like or are kind of uh, indifferent to or laugh at. And one of those is um, he is launching a competition or, or a, a, a pillow line to compete with my pillow and Mike Lindell, uh, sort of a liberal Insanely version. Insanely funny. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, is- is there something about politics that gives you access to better pillow materials? Like, what is the angle here, dude? The my From pillow guy's like real name is like uh, what is it? it starts like it's something that sounds like my fuck. I gotta look it up. It's like Mike Pillow Mike? or something. Like so he just yeah, started it's up. Mike Lindell. Yeah. Oh, it's Mike. Yeah. 
right. so he he's kind of interesting because a I've heard like before that he got like involved as a public figure, the pillow was actually like pretty good. <laughs> like people were like, oh. Oh, he sucks. Well, that sucks. I really like the pillow. Yeah. Um, I can't. I can't personally, you know, testify to that. I have no idea. But uh, that seemed to be the case. But um, yeah, he's a crazy person. Um, who did he just get like uh, banned off of Twitter too? Like, you know, he. I think so. Yeah, he. Yeah. He was one of the insiders apparently. Of right. The, like after he got after he got caught walking into the White House with a plan to institute martial law, a thing <laughs> that he can do as the CEO of a pillow company. Um, <laughs> and Twitter was like, ah, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> well, it seems a bit shady that he's encouraging hundreds of people to go out and have such an active day. Afterwards, they're going to need a very restful place <laughs> to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it's it. A, yeah, it's a long time. Yeah, horizontal yeah. brain. The, the competing pillow company angle is hilarious to me. Right. It's, it's like well, it's also like so. I mean, Hog is definitely like liberal. He's not nearly as cool as Emma Gonzalez. I think her name is. Um, uh, he's definitely liberal. His dad's uh, in the CIA. Who's your favorite school shooting victim? We'll go around the circle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Drake from Degrassi. <laughs> you, really. In the show well, Degrassi, Degrassi, he got oh, shot, yeah, he got yeah, shot yeah. by a school shooter, and then yeah. The, and so, like in, in the wheelchair. later seasons, he's like in a wheelchair because he's paralyzed from the, the legs down. Yeah. There's a Columbine victim who uh, made a Christian movie at some point. That'd be interesting to watch. <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's this whole like uh, thing about um, standing in the face of school shooters because of God, because. Uh, one of the stories in Columbine was uh, that I, I have no idea if this is even true. But it's an like, urban legend. Reported. I think I know what you're about to say. Right. Yeah. Like a library somewhere where like the, the shooter like finds, you know, this girl cowering under the whatever. And um, and and he goes like, do you believe in God? Which is like a very specific, very useful for an urban legend type question to ask. Yeah. And uh, and she goes, yes. And he's like and, and then he asks something else. Like, would you believe in God if I told you not to so that you could survive the shooting or whatever? But in fewer words, because I'm a nerd. And um, and she goes, no, I'll always believe in God. And then he shoots her. Right. And so that story got like super widely reported. So there's there's like this super Christian know. angle that got tied to to school shootings i guess like you wouldn't do it if you were a christian which they told us uh, that at a catholic school a lot like it was going really? to oh, yeah. happen they brought yeah. it up like all the time <laughs> i think so that like, that's... don't say you're you believe in god when somebody's <laughs> well no that's no, that's your ticket like, right because get ready to die <laughs> yeah like if if you if you like affirm god right before like you got eternal life you don't have to worry about like cheating on your husband when you're 30 or anything like that like you don't have to ask for forgiveness later Man. you're like you're like 14 you said you believe in god you're dead now you're in heaven it's a ticket wow what a fucking trip the <laughs> shooters are on going around asking people if they believe in god that's, that's why i don't really like believe the the story. <laughs> i think What's it was that? debunked oh. i'm trying to look it up right now but i think that's that the person who reported it you later on up a school that's what you do said is that, that like... the priority <laughs> <laughs> do, do you see the daily wire has a school shooting movie that they produced yeah yeah. yeah, there's a God angle there too. I think, but I yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be shocking, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think they kind of replay that story a little bit, except it's like a social outcast who is the victim in that. I don't know. I didn't watch the movie, right? Um, Which was not the case with with Columbine. They were they were not unpopular kids. They yeah they were, were cool. just they, they had a podcast. <laughs> 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 um, I think that that you the person that... recanted that thing about the believing God, but it's interesting that, that... Well, like who told the story? Like how did they find this out? That's the <sighs> how does the story get told? I... Someone I heard it attention. through I'm God sorry, told everybody. somebody, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think God communicated and laid the story down. God told it. Yeah. Um, anyway, in my in my school shooter survivor power rankings, I think you got to put Gabby Gifford in there somewhere. Right? <laughs> not as, I guess she's not a school not shooter a school, survivor, but a so mass there were, shooting. There survivor. were books there though. Yeah. So, so kind of counts. Yeah, that'd be fucked uh, up if there was a school shooting at the referee school that all the referees go to together. <laughs> and they're all blowing their whistles, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> throwing flags. Yeah, this is certainly against the rules. <laughs> Those flags Whenever can do some are. damage, though. Did you, um, do you like? There's a player that sued a ref because the flag hit his eye and gave him an orbital fracture. Really? Like it ended his it, NFL career. Really? Wow! Like, like just the yellow thing they throw? Yeah. It the, got in the his one helmet? flag they have, yeah. Damn. Uh, um, yeah, the um, <laughs> I think it might have been Orlando Orlando Brown Senior. So like Orlando Brown Junior is currently in the NFL for the Ravens. Um, 
Yeah, I think it was Orlando Brown Sr. who uh, survived a flag, I guess. Um, but it ended his career because it like hit his eye and sued the ref. So like, yeah, they could do some damage. Jesus, because there's like metal like weighted beads. Otherwise, can you imagine oh. just throwing the cloth, right? It wouldn't Damn. make any sense. Yeah. yeah, I I was just watching. I'm I'm beginning my uh, NFL season withdrawal. Uh, so I was watching an old arena football game uh, from Kurt Warner's old team Dope. in the '90s. Yeah, Iowa Barnstormers. And there's a, a player who got injured because they set off fireworks in the in the state or in the arena. And some of the shrapnel got in his eye when he was playing. That's incredible. I yeah. mean, awful. But like, <laughs> what a story. Yeah. I do think if my sports career was ended by a ref's flag, my family would never hear the end of that for the rest of my life. Yeah, I hope That'd his be- son makes fun of him. Like, his son is in the NFL. Like, he has all kinds of clout to dunk on his dad. They're a football family. Generations. <laughs> my, my career ended after 20 years. I'm in the Hall of Fame. Your career ended, Dad, because a ref threw a flag at you. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> They're heavy. They're too heavy. <laughs> they should just be funny-looking flags that float. <laughs> 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 well, you know who's probably uh, not going to be joining the NFL anytime soon. I think David this is safe to say is David Hawk. Yeah, I think he's. Oh yeah, the competing made pillow it pretty clear. He, yeah, he's not interested in in a football. Are there like career. designs on the pillows, or are they just also normal looking pillows? It's a. Uh, uh, I'd imagine there's uh, they say mind. like. <laughs> There are, are you going to make an anime body pillow joke? I was going to make a that... really fucked up joke that I'll just get yelled at on the internet for. So, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Do we know the name Not as much the... as all the people who are going to be mad at me as they Google Ray Kareth, uh for what I said earlier. Um, but well, now they're going to have to because you referenced. It, here's I have a question about David uh, Hogg and his pillow company. Why why doesn't he do a commercial at the Super Bowl? Isn't he trying to out promote the fucking my pillow guy? Maybe he, he will. Yeah, you don't. Maybe know. they'll have dueling commercials back to back. Um, that would actually be a, a phenomenal like cross promotion if they just they they did dueling commercials against each other. Right. Yeah. It's a it's a competition of teams. Why not make it a competition of Pillows as well. Yeah. yeah. Pillows. Yeah. Uh, but I think one of the designs, I, I or this may be a sticker that he's hawking, uh, just says like proud soy boy or something. That <laughs> sucks. So That's awful. Apparently, though, his uh, factory or, or the, the, pr- the production of it is going to be union. They're going to be union. I was going to ask if it was union. That's like very, yep. All yeah. right. Yeah, That's, sure. That's nice. But it's still like, you know, sort of the Starbucks mentality or the Chick-fil-A thing where it's like your praxis is what you buy, you know? And so, yeah. uh, that's consumer activism. Yeah, laugh. exactly. Yeah. Well, won't you sleep better at night on a hog log? <laughs> oh, that's, I would buy man. a hog log actually. I want to eat a hog log. <laughs> hopefully there won't be an issue with the, uh, Washington hogs when they change their name to the hogs, which, uh, should be happening any day now. Uh, per my suggestion. Wow. <laughs> They're just going to use his name like that? <laughs> <laughs> that's they, Washington they, David Hawks. That's so offensive. <laughs> <laughs> without without even like asking or consulting him, just like one day they just, yeah, we're the Washington David Hawks. It's your face on the, on the, in fact, it looks exactly like the old logo, but it's just David Hawk. Yeah, <laughs> we had a boy cowering, but now it's a man selling pillows. We haven't centered on the mask guy yet. <laughs> the headdress on and shit. <laughs> um, well, there is um, another union issue uh, that popped up. I think just yesterday, uh, former president Donald J. Trump. That still feels weird to say. Uh, wrote a letter to his union, which he has. He has. Like a president's union, like they, like they band together and demand like better pension. No, maybe they should. I mean, because that that's not a you know, too con- Well, it would be controversial, but I think Jimmy you know, Carter demands to be heard. Yeah, I know <laughs> Jesse Ventura has complained to me that the governor of Minnesota is underpaid. Um, so that may be an issue. Very relatable us. problem. We yeah. all have. Well, I mean, I think there is something I, to be said I for like. Get it. Yeah. You should have to. You shouldn't have to be a millionaire to become. You know, like right, there's some people is, who are like cut cut the the salary for. It is like Congress optically a tough argument to make because you immediately get to move into something called the governor's mansion. 
Uh, and so when you live in something called the governor's mansion and you're like, yeah, I don't know if I get paid enough. It's just it's a tough argument to like make even no, if it, you're right. You just got to know how to spin it. Jesse Ventura comes out. He's like, I'm living in public housing. Look at this. <laughs> It's technically true. Speaking of, Jesse Ventura was, like, was at like the forefront early on, uh, at least among white people, on the Washington issue, on the name. Like he hated the name. He's been showing up to protests about oh, yeah. the name. Has been for years. <laughs> so he's just cool. an enigma of different views cobbled together. <laughs> oh yeah, there's no amazing. like ideological coherence to anything he does. It's amazing. <laughs> right. It depends on the day. Well, the the union that Trump is actually in is SAG AFTRA. Um, yeah. which is what he retired from. It's, it's just... Right. Because they're With having... the TV actor guild, that one? Yeah, because he was a fucking TV actor. Yeah, I yeah. didn't even think about that. Wait, if you're on a reality show, you get to be in SAG? None uh, of us well, have Well, he's also in other jobs. stuff. Um, oh, yeah, that's he right, said, right. And this is what he says in the letter uh, after saying to the, the president of the union, while I'm not familiar with your work, <laughs> I am very proud of my work. Got on movies Wait, such classic. as Home Alone 2, Zoolander, and Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps, and television shows such as The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, SNL, and of course, one of the most successful shows in television history, The Apprentice, to name just a few. He knows how to write a letter. <laughs> but, okay, like, let's go back to just the first paragraph, because every section of this is dripping with Trump gold. Like, there's always yeah, exclamation every points. I write you to you regarding the so-called disciplinary committee hearing aimed at revoking my union membership. Who cares? That's how he opens his letter. <laughs> wow. Who cares? Wow. Explanation Bars. point. He Fucking didn't even president. do a question mark after who cares. <laughs> yeah, he put an exclamation point. <laughs> if, if you if you had erased his presidency and the birtherism right before it, I would be absolutely standing this letter. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the thing that Anders just read about how he's like, I was on The Apprentice uh, in Saturday Night Live, which is, he hates Saturday Night Live. He's like name oh, dropping yeah. it here. I was say in that. Zoolander. He, <laughs> he does. Zoolander. He says Zoolander. Two episodes you might time. remember me from such films as Home Alone 2. <laughs> <laughs> he also says, I've also greatly helped the cable news television business, uh, in parentheses, said to be a dying platform with not much time left until I got involved in politics and <laughs> created thousands of jobs networks at ne or jobs at networks such as MSDNC and fake news CNN, among many others. Dude, that, that There's was so many the slams in this. this <laughs> everyone's bars. getting slammed. This has oh, that oh was my a God. part of the letter that made me question. Meek Mill will never recover from this. <laughs> this has I the thought it might not be real for a second because I was like MSDNC. DNC, does he mean the Twitter account, the parody Twitter account, MSDNC? Is this a fake letter? But no, that's, that's, that's what he refers. calls it. No, he's just yeah. being clever. This has the fucking presidential seal on it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> And in the last few are... days when everyone was worried he was going to launch a nuke, this is what he was doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then he goes, which brings me to your blatant attempt at free media attention to distract from your dismal record as a union. Your organization has done little for its members and nothing for me besides collecting dues and promoting dangerous un-American policies and ideas, as evident by your massive unemployment rates and lawsuits from celebrated actors who even recorded a video asking... Why isn't the union fighting for me? These, however, are policy failures. Your disciplinary failures are even more egregious. I no longer wish to be associated with your union. As such, this letter you is... You can't fire me, I quit? Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, as such, this letter is to inform you of my immediate resignation from SAG-AFTRA. You have done nothing for me. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> wow. Crazy. I'm Incredible. stealing that sign-off. I mean, it's not totally wrong, right? I mean, I I hear SAG-AFTRA is has a lot of good aspects to it, but you know, they're also a, a union in in the twenty first century, which have become sort of you know out of touch with with membership. Although I I think they're probably because of their members are in the uh, industry they are. I guess maybe they're better than other ones, but uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it would be yeah, it would be. Funny if he became like the champion of unionization in the entertainment field, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> he's going to join mean, the DSA yeah. now that he's out yeah. of work. 
Uh, New working group only for ten. <laughs> <laughs> and also, it's also true that he did like revive cable news, right? Like, I don't think that's that inaccurate. Like, they they were faltering before him, and he was he was a ratings boom. It was a mutual. But he he owes as much to them as they owe to him. Right? Yeah, they gave him like what like thirty million in free advertising or something yeah. like that. And his campaign, like the first time around, only spent like one and a half million on campaign ads. <laughs> <laughs> like. Yeah, I mean it's it's a co-productive relationship. They Absolutely. we we all dove into hell together. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He's a, he knows how to spin shit. That's what I'm saying, man. It's all spin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he could be the president. <laughs> <laughs> he's he running. Could be again. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Depending on how the trial goes, uh, <laughs> if he gets impeached or not. I mean, yeah, that's. He could be the president, depending on how the trial goes. Totally normal <laughs> sentence. I love, I love that the threat of him, if, if he's not impeached, the threat is he's going to come back and win again. <laughs> if that happens, you just have to uninstall democracy. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's over. They got the cartridge blow into it. Like, yeah, this is screwed up. <laughs> I suck at this game. Honestly, it's, it's, I deserve to. Get the controller's it. disconnect. It's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if he's he's odds are bad or good in in four years. I mean, if they or three years, yeah, I guess uh, it depends on how bad Biden fucks up. Like, I could see. A, I mean, a the track record win. thus far is not spectacular. So, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's in the cards, especially given how much fraud we all had to commit in order to get him in there. Mm-hmm. A Absolutely. lot of work. Yeah, yeah. my hand is tired from voting. <laughs> yeah, I look hacking the Dominion voting machines was tough. It was hard. <laughs> this yeah. is absolutely going to get clipped. <laughs> <laughs> By who? Is it true though that uh, Lindy, little Mike Lindell, is running for Minnesota governor? That's what I've been. Oh, hearing. Lindy? Uh, maybe. Yeah, he can't win. No, I don't right. think he'll win. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the, the, the thing about the thing about Minnesota is like they. It, it fosters just such an incredible atmosphere for conservative crazies. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Michelle Bachman is a really good example of that, but they don't do well at the statewide level because you have to play in Minneapolis and St. Paul where all the votes are. So like Michelle Bachman, for example, uh, won the district in Stillwater pretty spectacularly for a number of years in a row. Um, And, uh, and, and that's kind of where a lot of that comes from Um, is just kind of outstate Minnesota. But for for like state level races, like you have to be kind of if you're if you're a Republican, you have to be like boring as Tim Pawlenty. Um mm-hmm. or if you're a Democrat, I mean, I guess you could be anything. Right. Because like Paul Wellstone won with like the most insane campaign possible oh, yeah. his first year as a senator. Um, but um, but yeah, as, as a Republican, you just can't really be that far out there, which is um, why, of course, it was really weird that Trump got as close as he did. Uh the against Hillary in Minnesota, but mm-hmm. there was still like a substantial Evan McMullen vote in Minnesota as well. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So like, sure, yeah, there's like a, a a decently sized Mormon population in yeah. Minnesota. They may have gone for him. Yeah. Well, I had, I had a friend text me after the election. They were like, "Hey, you haven't talked to me for three weeks. Um, do you think I voted for Trump? Is that why you haven't talked to me?" And I was like, <laughs> "Well, no, but now that you bring it up, uh, <laughs> let's talk about that." And she's like, oh, no, 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 I voted for Evan McMullen. And I was like, well, I, I mean, of the two options you presented me, that's better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <are> we... <laughs> so, you know what? The, the new, uh, new rule for our friendship is we just don't discuss this ever again. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's you know, the penalty. You don't have to talk about this. Uh, you brought this up. I wasn't. I was. <laughs> look, I, I just have depression. But don't worry about it. <laughs> you don't have to talk to me about this. <laughs> I mean, I still not to like uh, fetishize voting too much, but I one of my favorite things I did as a Minnesotan was vote for Alan Page. So uh, if he could be maybe he could become governor, that would be awesome. Oh, yeah. He's never running. Uh, no. um, yeah. Well, I mean, that's actually the reason he never ran for chief justice is because he would win by too much. That's literally the reason <laughs> is, um, yeah, I think people would vote for me, not because I had the best ideas or that my legal jurisprudence was like really solid but because they remember me from the vikings and that's kind of fucked up so i'm not gonna run for chief justice um but i do think i'm qualified which is why i ran for like associate supreme court justice and he is i mean like he he's usually the opinion writer um when uh when you know 
whatever case is resolved and, and he's in the majority. So like he's clearly, you know, qualified, but you know, he just decided, no, um, that would be weird. And it would be kind of inappropriate to, to use that for like additional power if that's like not even the reason that people are voting for me. Plus, I mean, mm -hmm. he retired from the Supreme Court for a reason. He's like 90 now. I don't know. He's so oh, dope, is he 90? Wow. Yeah, he's he's old. Yeah, he's a fascinating person. Uh, yeah, and, and he like refused the battle of freedom from Trump, too. Like, you know, he's got nice. he's got a whole thing going on. Yeah. yeah. That would have been that an awkward ceremony. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but while we're on the topic of, of unions, uh, as far as they go, what do you think the NFLPA, where do you think it like ranks um, in the union world? Do you think that like the more like among sports or, unions, ju just unions in general, but I guess. Among oh, sports. Uh, well, unions in general, like probably bottom tier, wherever mm -hmm. that is, um, definitely way below SEIU, even below AFL-CIO because they suck now. Um, well below all the Teamsters and the the Metropolitan Transportation Unions for sure, not even close. Um, yeah, we're talking a farm league union. Yeah, absolutely. Like to, like a G League union for sure. Um, just a just an abysmal union. And then among sports unions, uh, probably third. I don't know. Um, <laughs> what makes it What makes it so bad? Uh, I mean, there's like a couple of reasons. I think one is like. Specific to the union itself, I don't think that the leadership has been particularly good. They don't do a really great job of, um, you know, motivating uh, their membership. They don't do a great job of, like, kind of canvassing their membership for what they want. They don't do a great job of communicating with their membership about what they're doing or why they're doing it, which is why you end up with public spats between players and the union that represents them, which mm -hmm. is nuts to me. Um, they were they were stronger in the past, which is why um, some of the player strikes and lockouts were so successful in the past. So um, some of the structural factors that prevent them from becoming a really effective union aren't set in stone. They have been effective in the past. Um, but then also there are structural factors that prevent them from becoming effective. Like one of the reasons um, that the, the, the NBA uh, basketball players union, the MBPA, is a much better union is because um, – you have alternative labor possibilities. So you've got increased leverage in negotiations because mm -hmm. you can go to Europe to play, to China to play, to Turkey to play, um, wherever. And that gives you some kind of leverage. And the same thing is true of the, the NHL Players Union. Um, you can play in Europe. You can play in Russia, right? Um, that's not true in the NFL. So you don't have that leverage available to you. So that's right. one structural factor. Another structural factor is that um, as much as um, – you know, the NFL is the most popular sport. It's not as much of a personality driven league as the NBA is. And so mm -hmm. you don't get to use the personalities in the same way. They represent a much larger swath of people. Um, and uh, the NBA Players Union, for whatever reason, um, maybe it's because they've accepted the the travesty that's the max contract, um, does a better job kind of representing everyone's interests, whereas the NFL Players Union um, is structurally geared towards protecting. Um, the lowest paid players, which makes sense. That's their voting base for union leadership. Um, but the most obviously high profile players are like the highest paid players. And so they're sometimes at odds. And so when the 2011 lockout was uh, was coming near an end, like Drew Brees and Tom Brady were uh, were about to set a public campaign against it and might have even like tried to sue the union. Um, which is like a tremendously bad look, but like, you know, they're the highest paid players and they were like, yeah, this union isn't protecting us. And, you know, everyone is like, yeah, who cares what it's not <laughs> about you. You're fine. What the hell, dude? Yeah. Um, and w hilarious, like Chris Cluey of all people like lit them up. <laughs> um, and, and that was like part of the reason they decided to back down or whatever, which is like wild to me that Chris Cluey could just be like, uh, could, could motivate Drew Brees to do anything at all. But, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's like part of it. Whereas with the with the basketball players union, um, they they do a much better job of having those leaders. Like Kyrie Irving, for example, as as funny as he is as a public figure, um, he's a tremendously great like union. I think he's the union vice president. He's mm -hmm. really great at that, um, and he does a really good job representing players' interests well, and, and in particular players who um, are not in position to earn max contracts like he is. And so they do a better job of kind of unifying across the different levels of of earnings for their players. Uh, and so they're much more unified in that respect. So there are some structural factors that prevent the, the NFL players union from being good. Uh, but there's also individual factors to that union where they don't even take advantage of the levers that they have. Like, for example, that like we know that replacement players are just absolute garbage and that we don't want them. And that's the leverage and they don't ever use it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and if they if they had plans to take care of their players through potential strikes or lockouts, you know, they would be able to hold a much stronger line. But they they never invested in an infrastructure that allowed them to do that. Like there's no like the union dues that they pay don't go towards um, like finding ways to help players like survive strikes, which I think the NBA players union does. I'm pretty sure the the MLB union does. Wow. Yeah. How I, do um, players what, get a union going? Is it, was there like a period of, 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 of sports atrocity where, where where players like sacrificed to get the union and you yeah. have to thank them now? Yeah, there were also yeah, uh, they would make children like little British children play the football game like uh, <laughs> right. the jungle. They put their little hands in the football machine. Yeah. Because they didn't want to right. Oh, the gear. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, also, like. At some point, like player salaries and uh, football revenue were like put up against each other and were made public, and people were like, "Wow, that's that's really fucked up. You should do something about that. You're making like forty thousand dollars a year in like today's money, right? right. You're making like forty thousand dollars a year, and they're making a billion. Uh, that that seems like wrong, right? You should probably do something about that. And it sounds, so, uh, just crunching the numbers, it sounds incorrect. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, of all people. Uh, Reggie White, who sucks, but well, I guess he's dead, so he can't suck anymore. But um, sued the NFL for free agency. Um, so there was like, there's a period before that where there was technically a free agency. It was called Plan B free agency. It was, it was terrible. Like, in order to sign somebody from another team, um, so their contract had to have expired, which is like a normal thing, right? That to be able to sign somebody, they're not with the team. But in order to do that, you would sign somebody and then you'd have to provide them like trade compensation. For some stupid reason, even though the team no longer wanted that player, as evidenced by the fact that they didn't offer them a contract, uh, and you would have to provide trade compensation to their previous team. And so that kind of there was no labor movement in the NFL for years and years and years until Reggie White sued the NFL and actually won in a Minnesota court, despite the fact that at the time he was playing for Green Bay. Um, Mm. And uh, and that established the modern era of free agency and player salaries shot up. Um, and in order for the uh, ability of owners to kind of maintain as much profit motive as possible, they try to institute a salary cap. And that's when I think uh, like unionization um, really kicked in because they were like, well, I mean, now that we're getting paid a market value, you want to distort the market and hold us out by engaging in like illegal oligopolies. Um, and uh, and that's screwed up. We're not going to have it. And so they ended up um, hammering out union agreements that – did uh, increase player compensation for a short period of time, but did institute a salary cap as a means of, in theory, instituting um, competitive parity, which the players agreed would be good for the NFL, uh, which, I mean, that was the prevailing understanding at the time that you shouldn't have super teams, but also at the time, like the Cowboys and the Steelers were winning every Super Bowl. So, mm-hmm. you know, who knows? But um, that, that seemed to be the idea. Um, I don't think that that's true anymore or something that people really care about uh, as much. Like, I think competitive parity, first of all, the Patriots made that a lie. But second, yeah. <laughs> um, th- there's a lot of really good evidence that that competitive parity doesn't actually drive um, viewership one way or the other. Um, like, the Premier League is a really good example of a league that doesn't have competitive parity and it still draws all kinds of views. Um, and so th- that's no longer a thing, which is probably why they should get rid of the draft. It's probably why they should uh, eliminate salary caps and so on. But mm. – um, at the time, the union agreed to the salary cap in part because they also agreed that if it was good for the game, it was good for the players, and that it would increase their share of the the revenue pie. But their percentage of the of NFL revenue has gone down every single negotiation. So it used to be like up at fifty four percent. Now it's like forty five percent. And uh, yeah, I don't know. The union it just keeps on giving ground. Well, one of the interesting sort of uh, contrasts that we're seeing like right now, especially between uh, leagues, NFL and NBA, is uh, t- well, two people from from Jake's hometown of Houston. James Harden wanted out of the Rockets, mm-hmm. and he was uh, able to make that happen and come to Brooklyn. Uh, you and- are wearing a fat suit, allegedly. Just like me. <laughs> All three of those things, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Jake had to, yeah, fight his his stand-up team that was keeping him in, in Houston. I'm wearing uh, a fat suit right now. I'm actually not fat. <laughs> Agreed. But, but Desh- Deshaun Watson right now, uh, excellent quarterback on a crappy team, uh, wants to go somewhere else, but th- th- there's like this totally different attitude towards him. Not that everybody was like 
thrilled about uh, Harden. Uh, but it, it's, he's, seem, he's seeming like it, he's uh, people think he's getting too big for his britches for, for wanting to go to a different team, which is not that unusual, but uh, I guess the way he's doing it is or something. No, so, it's like, a part of it's that he's black. Yeah. Uh, it's, he's it's not too big for his britches. He's wearing a fat suit. <laughs> <laughs> he should put on a fa- he should get really fat. And LB, like, yeah, that's yeah good. so they would have to get rid of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, w- w- the thing that was like surprising to me is that two players that have spoken out against Deshaun. Uh, well, no, I guess uh, I guess the other one is actually speaking out against Dak Prescott. But um, Brett Favre was like, Deshaun Watson should just kind of shut up and play. And it's like Brett Favre, are you? Yeah, that guy, God. the guy who whined his way out of Green Bay and then New York, that guy, like <laughs> the guy who sent like the tiny dick pics to to <laughs> Jen Sturger, that guy, he says no drama, really. Um, so like there was that the guy that forced his way out of multiple teams was like ah it's Sean Watson I mean you should just shut right. up and play. It'd be uh, one thing if his uh if his disruption involved prayer and jeans, but no, this no, is out of yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, and then Carson Palmer said that Dak Prescott uh, should have just signed whatever contract that da- the Dallas Cowboys offered him, which was insane because Carson Palmer threatened to retire if the Bengals didn't trade him, then did retire when the Bengals didn't trade him and then got traded uh, to Oakland for a first round. Like he forced the Bengals to trade him. Uh, And uh, that that just like an insane series of statements about from former players that are like profoundly anti-player. And part of that is just like the way football culture has evolved. Right. Because um, football was originally instituted in like Yale and Harvard and stuff like that Mm -hmm. um, to be kind of pseudo war. And, and that's not even, um, that was the explicit metaphor that proponents of football would use. Like we need to institute this because we are not currently involved in war, and that's making our boys soft. That, I mean, that, they explicitly said that. <laughs> and so uh, we'll we'll make them fight in wars, but it's going to be football. And um, and this was before World War One. Um, I always thought that was true, but I didn't know that you could actually track it to yeah, like, it was like public statements, right? Uh, and then too many people died playing football. And so Teddy Roosevelt was like, wow, this is a little bit too hardcore for even me. <laughs> yeah. um, you've got to change the rules. And they instituted the forward pass, which didn't exist before then. Um, and at and first, like, so you what could was never... the game then? It, it was, was a bunch rugby? of running. Just running. Yeah, it was actually very similar to rugby. Yes. But yeah, um, it was a bunch of running. It was like three yards in a cloud of dust, but like every single time. And you get scores that were like six to three. Um, so it, it sucked. But. You know, I mean, it was for tough some re- military. And for some people they were did like, die. But yeah, they did die. <laughs> they did die. Well, just like uh, in war, I mean, you got to break a few eggs, right? If you, you want to <laughs> yeah. not have any soy boys. But for some reason, they were like, really, they everyone really hated the idea of the forward pass. So at first, it was like you had it was a turnover if you threw an incompletion. Yes, like, it was a turnover lose. if you threw an incompletion. Yeah, and you would lose and, yardage even if you got a completion. It was like a penalty for doing it, but you were allowed to do it and. But then I it was, it was nuts. Well, so you could the, kick a field goal, but you had to prove you were straight. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because the forward pass, I think, really evolved around the time, uh, or it really became a more mainstream part of the game around World War II, uh, which some people have kind of traced to like the quarterback, you know, having. Well, so, some... so there's two evolutions of the forward pass. One um, is because the Carlisle Indian School um, needed a way to beat. Um, players from Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and uh, I mean, so they're they're one of the um, you know boarding schools that uh, were, were built as a way to um, commit genocide against uh, the native population, uh, and they they kidnapped uh, American Indians uh, from their parents and 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 forced them to assimilate and um, speak English and like Luther culture and stuff like that in these schools, um, and and some of the people involved in that were genuinely attempting to be humanitarian about it, and some of the people were not. They were committing a genocide, um, but you know it's it's a part of the racist idea that the culture that um, you know these American Indians were coming from um, was like backwards and savage. We have to fix them, right? Uh, and so they attempted to be humanitarians, but with like a racist set of beliefs. Either way, um, these boarding schools uh, would not attempt to compete with, uh, you know, these colleges until the Carlisle Indian School. And um, they and, and they had to like fight to do it. Like it was it was really tough and, and teams would sometimes refuse to play them and people would not show up to games and refs refused to referee. Um, but uh, at some point, Carlisle Indian School got to play against Yale and Princeton and Harvard and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, their their kids were like underfed. 
right? And so they were smaller. Um, they couldn't compete in traditional football tactics. Uh, and they're going up against, um, you know, like people who like actually worked out, like, you know, the people from, from Harvard and stuff like that, the people who wanted to play football because it killed people. They have uh, this old timey upside down triangle bodies. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Used to be in movies. It's yeah. like, like a DC leotard animated. With uh, the one, yeah. goes over the one <laughs> shoulder and shit. Right. Yeah. Handlebar mustache, et cetera. Well, yeah, that's exactly who it was. And so Pop Warner, who was the coach of the, the Carlisle Indian school was like, well, now that they've legalized the forward pass, we'll just use it. And so uh, they demolished some of these teams by throwing it, um, which at the time, even though it was legal, was seen as unsportsmanlike and cheating. <laughs> That's um, so weird. <laughs> right. And so and Pop Warner was like, well, it's not cheating if it's in the rules. Right. So we'll just do it. I don't like they already don't like us. So, like, who cares? <laughs> um, and so they would. <laughs> Uh, in coincidence, it's the best technique in the game. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and yeah, and, and it was interesting. Like sometimes they would just get scores taken away from them just because like they were Indians. And uh, there's one yeah. game where they lost by like one point <laughs> and like the Yaleys walked up to the to the um, to the Carlisle Indian school kids and were like, wow, you beat the shit out of us. We definitely lost. Well, that's too bad. We win. Bye. <laughs> and, and there was another time like Princeton, I think, walked out because the refs were, were refing too much in their field. Like it was blatant, like how, how bad the refereeing was. But like passing became so dominant that colleges had to begin um, to pass. Um, so that was part of it. And then there was a passing revolution in the NFL in the 40s, like right after World War II. Um, and that was like Sid Luckman and stuff. They, they, uh, they installed something called the wing T. They beat Washington by like 73 points or something crazy like that uh, in, in the NFL championship game. So uh, they decided they should pass more. And then they instituted some rules that made passing hard. And so we had just awful passing um, through the late 60s all the way up until 1978. So that's the history of passing. Damn. 1978, that was the West Coast offense coming along? or uh, No, there, there was a bunch of rule changes to open oh, up the I game. Oh, I see. I see. Um, so okay. the West Coast offense didn't uh, – well, actually, it was kind of installed around the same time. Uh, interestingly, in Cincinnati, of all places, right. um, with, uh, with Ken Anderson, because the previous quarterback, like Greg Cook, I think his name was, got injured, and uh, Bill Walsh was like, well, we can't run our offense um, with Ken Anderson. He doesn't even know how to throw the ball. Uh, and so he was like, well, what if he only threw it two yards? I mean, that sounds fine. And he invented, uh, like modern football, essentially. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, a bunch of rule changes in 1978, like here's a crazy rule change that people don't like realize prior to 1978, offensive linemen could not use their hands to block. (laughs) (laughs) And so they would like, they would have to block with their elbows and use the chicken wing technique. And it was just awful. (laughs) Oh my God. Um, and so if you drop back to pass, you'd probably just take a sack because defensive linemen could do whatever they want, including like at the time the head slap was legal. Um, and so they would do that a ton. Yeah. You would just slap the guy in the head and he can't use his hands. Right. So yeah. like, what's he going to do? You know what? I, I always wondered how it would be ruled if the quarterback hit a defender in the helmet with the football, just like bludgeoned them. And then, Oh, like just like, like grab and then, yeah, they use oh, it as yeah. a weapon. Are, that should that be an automatic three-yard gain, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, and another rule change was that they wouldn't allow defensive backs to murder wide receivers. Uh, so they would start <laughs> – act, They, I think they invented defensive pass interference in 1978 because um, really? before you could just do whatever you wanted. Yeah. Um, and uh, and just like demo- – and so like it didn't make sense because receivers couldn't get open because as the ball was arriving, you could just grab them and pull them down. Like I don't even know how you could pass the ball in that environment. But they made that illegal, and so in 1978, the, um, the live ball era – uh, I guess is what you call it um, started and, and Bill Walsh threw it more than anyone else. And then when he was able to take it over to the San Francisco 49ers, um, he drafted Joe Montana in the third round and was like the West coast offense is perfect for this guy. Now that we've got a good quarterback, um, we can actually, you know, institute this offense um, in a way that, that scores a ton of points, which I mean, Ken Anderson was like, had like the best statistics of his era, but nobody respected him because he threw two yard passes. So. Right. That's such a funny dynamic between Bill Walsh and uh, Paul Brown because they were both sort of like blackballed by their own team. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, Paul Brown started the Cleveland Browns and then for for some reason they just like kicked him out. Uh, and so he went to Cincinnati and made another team with the same colors and initials and everything. Yes. And then he like bl- when he retired, he blackballed Bill Walsh uh, from ever working anywhere. And then eventually he got a job with the 49ers and in his his first and last Super Bowls faced the Bengals for revenge. 
Yeah, um, it's incredible. Like teams would call the Bengals. They're like, "Hey, your passing offense is pretty good. Can we hire? Or can we interview your offensive coordinator to be a head coach?" And at the time, there were no rules about that. And so uh, Bill Walsh was like, "Oh no, he's a piece of shit. You don't want him. He sucks. I don't even know why I employ him. Why wow, you don't want to talk to him? Uh, or not? Yeah, not Bill Walsh. Paul Brown was like Paul that. Brown. Yeah, yeah. Paul Brown had all kinds of." clout because right. he was a winning coach right like he invented modern football in the nfl essentially yeah um and um and now because of the unions it's sort of that rule changed right that they can't like blackball each other in yeah, that way. yeah. right yeah, yeah, yeah um so like the the coaching unions have, have prevented teams from being able to block uh coordinators from um, interviewing for head coaching positions and now new rule uh for this year position coaches cannot be blocked from interviewing for coordinator positions um, with other teams. But yeah, at the time, um, Paul Brown, you know, he'd receive a call from a team and, and he would just, he wouldn't just deny them the opportunity to interview his wildly successful offensive coordinator. You just badmouth them. And so even after Paul Brown retired, nobody wanted to touch Bill Walsh. So he had to uh, coach at Stanford, I think. Um, and he did well enough there that the 49ers were like, yeah, we might as well try this out. Our coach sucks. So our team sucks. So yeah. we might as well just do it. And it worked out all right for them. Yeah, a couple of rings. Well, now it, it seems like uh, the rules changes are kind of like t- t- going in the opposite direction of what we mentioned earlier when they, when they were anti-pass. Now it seems like it's moving towards a, a very pass-heavy league, which I like. I mean, I like watching passing better than running, I guess. But uh, there's also been this focus on protecting the quarterback to where uh, I guess you – I mean, it's still a very brutal game, but you can have someone like Tom Brady – We'll be playing this weekend um, as a 42, 43 year old, 43, uh, yeah, 43 year old quarterback. Um, very handsome. <laughs> More handsome at 43 than he was at 22. Have you seen the pictures? Good Lord. He's ugly. He's become, a, right now. he's become a metrosexual. He's, he's been designated <clears throat> one. I know, but the, uh, yeah, the modern metrosexual of the 2010s. Uh-huh. Mm. Uh, but I think there's a really interesting contrast i guess here between him and patrick patrick mahomes as far as you know playing styles and they're also a very uh, well, well tom brady will tell you it's because he doesn't eat tomatoes so really he has this weird diet where what he, so he well, you didn't know about tomatoes? this yeah, yeah he's got a whole thing so like it's the tb12 system because of uh-huh. course it's branded and of course he sells it and of course he uh forced the patriots to install a whole tb12 center inside their facility um <laughs> But yeah, and, and no tomato it, right? zone in the facility. Yeah, well, nothing, uh, nothing um, that uh, is related to I, I, nightshade. That's it. No nightshade, um, whatever's which tomatoes were previously. You know, mm. they they actually were at one point poisonous, which is why um, Europeans wouldn't eat them for so long. Uh, it actually made sense, but they were poisonous for a while. But yeah, tomatoes no longer poisonous. He still won't eat them. Um, and any foods that quote unquote cause inflammation. So there's like a whole variety of foods that he won't eat as a result of that. Um, I should go on that diet. Honestly, it's uh, histamines, right? That's tomatoes are high in histamines and yeah. Inflammation caused by histamines. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it's a whole, it's like a very unscientific diet is the, is the, Hmm. and so like, uh, he doesn't have any dairy, which, you know, depending on your genetic makeup, that's actually probably a good thing. But, um, there's there's all kinds of stuff in the diet that don't make a ton of sense. Um, his wife sold him on something called blue solar water, which is just water that you leave out in these blue bottles in the sun, and it changes their crystal. I mean, it doesn't, but the theory is that it changes their crystalline structure to give you like chi and energy and stuff. Huh. Um, but yeah, uh, so what? the whole thing was was helped designed by I want to say his name is Alex Guerrero, who is a quack doctor, and I can't even be sued for saying that um, <laughs> because uh, he has been called that multiple times. And he has been, he's lost his medical license in multiple states. Um, he's also Tom Brady's like personal physician um, and, <laughs> and runs the TB12 stuff. So he's like their nutrition and pliability expert. Um, wow. and, and so like, instead of getting like massages, um, players would go to his facility inside the Patriots facility uh, and get worked on by Alex Guerrero. Um, so yeah, whole thing with Tom Brady, super weird diet. His parents, every time they visit him, they like have dinner with him and, and Giselle Bunchen, and then they leave and get something to eat. Like it's it's a whole like <laughs> because like they're like, hey, do you want some ice cream? And they're like, oh yeah, we love ice cream. I do know you eat ice cream, and it's just like mashed up avocados with with, with a sugar substitute like stevia or something. Oh my god! Like, uh... Yeah, <laughs> the, like disgusting food. 
Wow. Imagine that's your child. What? Is it? Is that what the key the to his fuck? success, though? Is, is it no. like magically? What, what, what is it then? Just his like maniacal, monomaniacal drive? or Yeah, he's Michael Jordan. He's homicidally competitive. Like okay. if he could kill somebody, get away with it, he would. Which, uh, <laughs> I mean, most good quarterbacks are insane, right? Like yeah. I mean, they're insane like Michael Jordan's insane. Like it's not that it works, right? Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, a big part of it is also that – um, the offenses that he's working with get rid of the ball quickly, so he didn't have to get that. He doesn't take that many hits, even mm-hmm. when he does a quarterback sneak. He doesn't take that. You know, he doesn't right. take big hits. Um, so that's part of it. Um, part of it is just like luck. Like I, I feel like people always underrate that. Like ah, how does he? How did he stay healthy for so long? And it's like, well, he didn't get hurt. Like that's it. That's all it is. Like he <laughs> nobody get, threw a flag at his eye. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. So that's that's like part of it. Um, I, I really doubt that it has, I mean, cause like Peyton Manning lasted for a fairly long time and he ate like shit. Adrian Peterson eats like shit. Um, and he's still in the league. Amazingly. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, um, <laughs> Jared Allen told the story that like before the, before every game, like, so Jared Allen is, he's up for the hall of fame. We're going to find out, I think tomorrow, whether or not he's going to be uh, inducted in the hall of fame. 69 baby. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, Jared Allen's so much fucking fun, dude. Yeah. Um, but he was telling this story about Adrian Peterson. So Jared Allen, again, a Hall of Famer, right? Um, he's telling this story about Adrian Peterson. He's like, yeah, so every night before the game, you know, we get to eat, you know, whatever the, the hotel brings out um, beforehand. And a lot of us, me included, have to be very careful about what we eat. Otherwise, we'll gain a little bit too much weight and we'll be sluggish before the game. But Adrian Peterson won't eat a pint of ice cream. He'll eat like a gallon of ice cream. Jesus. And he'll eat pounds of wings um, the day before a game. And then the day of the game, um, he'll he'll just eat whatever he feels like, including seafood, which he is allergic, like deathly allergic to. <laughs> like he, he, there was one year with the Vikings that during training camp the ambulance showed up, and then Adrian Peterson didn't show up to practice. And we were like, was he in the ambulance? What happened? Oh my god! Uh, and it turns out he just ate shrimp because he felt like it, and uh, he's allergic to it, and he had to be carted to the hospital um, so he could is breathe. It- is it possible that the, his power then comes from his dynamic shits he's taking <laughs> before and after these meals? And that's got to be it, right? <laughs> he releases some. Yeah, it, I mean, it's funny. Like everybody has their own like thing that makes no sense but works for them. You know, like uh, Joe Namath would get drunk the night before every game, sometimes the day before every game. That makes uh, sense. Yeah, and the one yeah, time, fits. the one time he didn't do it. He had a terrible game, so then the team was like, "Never, <laughs> let's never do that again. Always get fucking." Yeah, shit you need made. to relax, man. Yeah, <laughs> you uh, have to be hungover. The weird uh, like crisis mode that your brain goes into in a hangover is real. It can it can fuel you to do like superhuman things because you tricked your body into thinking it's dying. Mm-hmm. I can attest to that. I've done this <laughs> Absolutely. before. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. well, Len Dawson would, would smoke during games. I mean, there's pictures of Len Dawson smoking on the sideline. That fucking rules. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a- as I mentioned, we are nearing the big ass The uh, I don't know when big who SB. coined this. Who coined superb owl? Because that was I a Colbert say, thing. Was it Colbert? Colbert yeah. and Reddit, I think. They, okay. Yeah. I remember first seeing it in like 2011. And I was like, "That's genius!" And now it's like <laughs> plastered Played everywhere. Out. Yeah. <laughs> this changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> the height of comedy <laughs> but one thing i always like about the super bowl is uh when is sort of forcing like political social themes into the narrative that don't always make any sense because it doesn't always work oh there's I mean, gonna be years... a ton of that this year because it's oh, covid yeah. super bowl i read an article uh-huh. the other day that fucking ice shared on twitter that's just like they're just gonna have like the national guard there for some reason because they're you know predicting I, some something is gonna happen. Like people are gonna rush the fucking Super Bowl or something. No oh, damn. Um, yeah, with COVID and then the Capitol stuff. Who the fuck knows? I yeah, can't I mean, think of a situation it, to rush the Super Bowl. <laughs> I would like I mean, to imagine that the ICE agents are just mad at the concept of football because it's all about crossing borders, and they're just like, <laughs> ah, 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 no, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, something crazy could happen, I guess, yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking of, like, the actual teams playing. Like, I remember one year in, like, tw- the 2012 season, it was the Ravens and the 49ers, and somebody on the 49ers said something homophobic, and then there's a guy on the Ravens who had two moms, so it was just like, yeah, we're going to root for the Ravens. That's, the that's like, the progressive 
thing to do this year. And then like when New Orleans was in the Super Bowl, even though it killed me uh, to root for them after the, what they, they did to the Vikings, um, you know, I cheered for them because of, of Katrina. The Katrina, yeah. They were the yeah. Katrina uh, storyline. Right. Oh, yeah, redeem New that. Orleans, yeah. Uh-huh. But then it's like like last year, I remember tr- the day of the Super Bowl, I was trying to figure out who I'm going to cheer for based on like political threads and <laughs> like could not come up with anything coherent. I mean, I the closest like, you can get is that like Nick Bosa is MAGA. Okay. And like, OK, yeah, I guess it's like one player for one team. But yeah, but Tom Brady is MAGA, right? And he's a friend yeah. of Trump anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, he won't say it anymore, but like, right. Um, yeah, it was it was nuts because I remember um, uh, Jared Goff was a draft prospect um, 2016. He was drafted in 2017, uh, and and he said something political, and it was like you know he's a he's a lib, right? And so he would he would like dunk on Trump and talk about how we should have public private partnerships at the same time, not really realizing kind of what right. the contradiction is there. But you know, sure, fine. Like like Jared Goff's dad was up for Surgeon General. Like that's the family oh, he really? comes from. Wow. Um, but you know, he, I'm, I'm very into the outspoken liberal comments you can make of the field. Like, I just want everyone to know love rules. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's exactly who Jared Goff is. Um, and, uh, and yeah, he, 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 he's like very, like clearly like a Democrat, like a dyed in the wool blue Democrat. And, uh, his coach was like, you know, you don't see these top quarterbacks out there making political statements. I don't think that's good. Uh, and the, like two days prior, Tom Brady did an interview where if you just looked over his shoulder in the lock or there was a MAGA hat, like a red MAGA hat. Um, and like, I'm losing my mind at this. But yeah, I, you know, they would ask him and he's like, well, I don't know anything about politics. He's just a friend. Uh, uh, fuck you, dude. But, he gave me a nice hat. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just you know, it's nice how he calls me when we win. Um, <laughs> unlike literally anybody else would. Like, I, like, what do you, anybody who had your number would call you after you, are you nuts? You're Tom Brady. It doesn't matter. <laughs> But yeah, um, yeah. The, the whole thing is that Tom Brady and Bill Belichick wrote a letter to Trump congratulating him, uh, and then he got like mad that Trump read it aloud because he was like, "Well, that letter should have been private. You know, I can't believe you would do that." Uh, the like, letter starts can't... off and it's like, "Loser, come on." <laughs> uh, whatever. The... <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. The, the there's a whole thing with the Patriots for MAGA, um, even though like. In Massachusetts, right? Like, that's a pretty blue state. Right. There's uh, a reason Tom Brady won't, like, talk about his friendship with the president or whatever. It's because right. he has to go home at the end of the day. And <laughs> right. <all> the insufferable <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, like, that was whole. So, it's always easier to cheer against Tom Brady for the normal reasons. And then also on top of that, like, the Trump reasons. Yeah, the food um, doesn't because, help either. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely not. Like, this freak is eating celery for dinner, right? Like, raw celery. Like, yeah. no, nah, I don't need that. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheer for Patrick Mahomes if it's ketchup on a steak. <laughs> Why can't you be normal and eat a gallon of ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what do you think the big clash is this year? What What does each team represent? What I mean, there's the generational storyline, right? Uh, do you think there's a political social one as well? Uh, I mean, probably not. Like, I mean, everything is political, so in some sense, yes. And then obviously, you can cheer against Brady because of that. But, like, you know, the the Buccaneers are a team that feels like a super team, even though almost all their talent is homegrown. But they signed Tom Brady. They signed Rob Gronkowski. They signed Antonio Brown, who's now very easy to cheer against. Um, And so there's always, like, you know, cheer against constructed super teams, cheer for naturally homegrown super teams like the Chiefs, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can't, like, you can't read too far into this culture shit because it's like, yeah, Antonio Brown sucks, but, like, so does Tyree Kill. He plays for the Chiefs. Um, yeah. This isn't this isn't like that interesting. Um, we want to support big natural teams. Well, what if yeah, we just sort of started teams. some rumors just from a whole cloth to try to make it fun in a yeah. couple days or whatever the what, what well, is it if, if Patrick Mahomes so, is in DSA. Yeah, um, someone's sure. a, a no masker. You know, maybe. <laughs> Oh yeah, you could you could you, I don't even think it would it would be that hard to start a rumor that Bruce Arians is an anti-masker. Um I don't think he is. I'm just saying it probably would not be particularly difficult to do that. The kicker on the Buccaneers voted for Jill Stein in 2016. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> that Florida. means it's more his fault than anybody else's. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, not even people who voted for Trump are as responsible as this guy. <laughs> um yeah, no. Uh the the, I don't think that there is as as clear a cultural sociopolitical divide 
Um, I'm just cheering for Patrick Mahomes because I hate Tom Brady, and also Patrick Mahomes is super fun. Yeah, uh, which and is his to say, dad was a Twins pitcher. Yeah, right? his, his, yeah, his dad was a Twins pitcher. Um, obviously, I'm not cheering for anybody because I'm a professional journalist and I don't cheer for teams. But oh, right, okay, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, but yeah. I did, I did lay down ninety eight dollars worth of bets. Um, but not actually. I don't know if gambling is legal in the state of Minnesota. So if I did that, I didn't actually do it. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so. I don't know. I just I just like watching Mahomes play. So that's that's yeah. what I'm cheering for. He's fun, and part of that I think is baseball, right? Because uh, yeah, I've heard this is it. a dynamic too. Is like uh, there's they're training more quarterbacks who have played baseball because the mechanics are better. And you watch him. Yeah, he's so much fun. He, he throws the ball in ways that shouldn't work, but he just does it masterfully. Yeah. Cause he played he played shortstop, so he's very used to having to throw at off platform at weird arm angles. Yeah, and he's using that in the NFL, which is interesting because for a while. Uh, quarterbacks who played baseball, teams would stay away from them um, because a traditional drop back pass um, does not it does not translate to pitching form very well. You know, because mm-hmm. they're two different balls, they get they do two different functions. And, I was going to ask, like, does the football spin and stuff when they do this? Yeah. Um, so uh, the way the football spins and the way baseball spins are very different, right? Because baseballs will spin end over end, and football spiral, right? Uh, and um, in baseball, like your grip matters a ton. Uh, and and how you torque your hand or your arm and how you set your shoulder and, and how you load your um, weight with your front foot and all that that all matters a lot. Some guy throws and the basketball like a like he's doing a basketball free throw because he used to play basketball and he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> not a ton of quarterbacks play a ton of basketball. Uh, a ton of football players have not a ton of quarterbacks. And it shows. <laughs> <laughs> Josh McCown did. Oh my god! So he a like, lot of kickers have with uh, field goals. That's an overlap. Hey, mm. uh, sorry. No, Josh McCown is funny because because uh, he's like this like forty year old white dude that's played for like half the league, and not a ton of people realize how athletic he is. But when he was playing for the Bucks, they would they did a charity basketball game, and he wiped the floor with his teammates. Like he was like he was forty at the time, and he was like, yeah, I was like McDonald's All American. What the hell, dude? <laughs> <laughs> he was nuts. And Donovan McNabb was a scholarship D one athlete. Um, like, uh, so he's the rare quarterback that play, and he could have been drafted to play, uh, in the NBA too, but not a ton of quarterbacks have played basketball, but yeah, uh, the, the you would stay away from quarterbacks that had, um, pitching experience cause it would screw up their form. Now they want quarterbacks that have played baseball, not necessarily pitchers, although pitchers as well, because people are realizing that your ability to throw off platform, off schedule at weird arm angles and, and kind of respond as bullets are flying, you know, that's actually, it turns out valuable to have, uh, which is why, you know, Kyler Murray um, is, is an exciting um, player that's, you know, got a baseball background. I think even Jared Goff has a baseball background, not that he's going to be throwing off platform too often. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a thing cool. now. That's going to be fun. All right. Last question. What's your, what's your final prediction for the score? Uh, what Chiefs are favored by three? I would. I'll take that. I'll take Chiefs uh, by seven or something like that. I don't know. They're they're a fun team. I have the, a, the Bucks are like a more complete team, but like the Chiefs will just score fifty on anybody. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I, I I have one thing I wanted to actually make some predictions about. What do you guys think the fucking like commercials are going to be like? Because that's like a big part of the Super oh, Bowl. Oh no, yeah. That's I was going to talk about that. That's going to be nuts, right? There's there's actually a, a prop that I bet on about uh, how many commercials. Throughout the entire, not just halftime, but throughout the entire commercial, are going to reference essential workers, uh, and the over under mm. was at three, and I was like, "That's <laughs> stu- I'm taking the over. all of them." Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to be three yeah. hours of like, "You've been so brave, <laughs> right?" Car insurance. Right. Yeah, you've been so brave. You've done so much for us. Anyway, let's cut back to the game with a packed stadium. Right. <laughs> I was thinking about this uh, because it's like, okay, the, the quintessential COVID commercial. You saw a lot of this shit during like the um, the inauguration and stuff like that, too. Mm-hmm. One of the quintessential things is like a uh, commercial that's like a bunch of people all over the world kind of on a Zoom call, like collaborating on a musical thing. So I think for sure we probably get one of those. And then a lot of times that includes like it, this one's a nurse or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. This one's a, I don't know, what of the other fucking popular essential worker there's, icons I are. I almost guarantee that there's going to be like a Morgan Freeman visa commercial talking about how brave it is to be a grocery store worker, which like, yeah, sure, why not? But also visa. Yeah. Also, Morgan Freeman, like he's 
dating his stepdaughter? I don't know. So, uh... What? Let's, Mor- uh, actually, let's go into that. Morgan Freeman. Let's I just watched a fucking movie with Morgan Freeman <laughs> the other day, and it's like, he gets... He's like, he is what he is. He represents this, like, kind of respected, like, elder, you know, guy. But he's, uh... I don't know if he's still dating her. I have to look this up. But for a while, he at least... He was dating, like, a 19-year-old that, like, was related to, like, a step, like, granddaughter or some shit. He was doing, like, Woody Allen shit. It's really weird. It's not, it never oh, gets fucking brought up. I did not know that. Yeah, it's really fucking weird. <laughs> but that's the well, type I of... I won't look that up, and I'll take your word for it. That's the fucking, <laughs> uh, the Not type... Best kept in the family. That's the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's the fuck. It's gross. Yeah, that is the level. Well, of, the fun thing with Morgan Freeman is you get to narrate any life film. Yeah, yeah it's, right. But that's the level of like absurdity that's usually kind of at play in those commercials. Like I, my, one of my predictions is uh, O.J. Simpson. I bet we see O.J. Simpson playing like Minecraft or something because like there's always some wild celebrity cameo like that, and then there's like uh, you know. Well, like a couple years ago, there was like Martin Luther King, like driving a Ford truck or some shit. <laughs> uh, I predict. Fr- I mean, well, I mean like- there, there's a very. F- I actually really like this commercial too. But like, there's that commercial of George Washington driving a Dodge Charger, uh, <laughs> and like running over like redcoats. It's it, the commercial rules, but like, <laughs> it is also like nuts, right? Well, they, just, they put a Dodge Charger in the middle of the Revolutionary War. With George Washington, that's kind of less like gauche, though. But like, I, I, true. I have yeah. a feeling we're going to get Fred Hampton this year because uh, radical politics have been sort of like slightly included in like the Overton window, but they still figure out a way to make him like sell yeah, you a video him just game like or something. Is Martin Luther King, right? Like, everyone forgets that Martin Luther King was a socialist. Yeah. Right? Right. Or like Helen Keller was a socialist. Like, that no one. You know, talk, it's, it's not part of the public memory anymore. But like, yeah, they'll they'll do that with Fred. They'll do that with Malcolm X. Like, it, yeah. it does not matter. They'll do that with anybody. Yeah. You know? No, that's what I'm saying. Because like, there's a movie about Fred Hampton out right now. It's actually written by the Lucas Brothers. I don't know if you guys knew that. I know. I couldn't mm-hmm. believe that shit. It's crazy. Are there more movies coming out from like people I've been in a basement with soon? Well, the, <laughs> the, the fuck Chicago, is going on? <laughs> the Chicago Seven or whatever. That movie was written by Sorkin. Yeah. Uh, um, and it's like Abby Hoffman was an anarchist. Like you should right. not. It was. It. It. It's very like. Um, kind of, well, I mean, it's Sorkin, right? So it's like liberal wet dream stuff. Yeah. Uh, and like, I didn't watch the movie because I. I don't want to. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so. I, pretty good reason not to watch the movie, I think. But um, yeah, uh, the the whole thing is was wild, and it's it's like all oh, the speeches and stuff. Because there's always speeches in the courtroom are about like liberal democracy. And like it come, kind of ignores the fact that Abby Hoffman was protesting the Democratic National Convention. Right. Uh, c- like, come on, dude. Like, th- they're all they're anarch- all, all of them are anarchists. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> well, this I think the the Lucas Brothers one is supposed to be good though. From from what I've heard, it's supposed to actually like stay true to the the radical vision. Well, I'm sure it is, but I'm also sure that liberals also will watch it right? and completely it? miss all the radical politics in it and be like, that was yeah. just a great movie about a guy believing in himself and a <laughs> <laughs> Could happen. And yeah. I think that's why I'm, I might... Well, I, I, they're probably going to spin a unity message, right? Because there's like some discourse on the timeline about uh, Fred Hampton working with... Uh, with white nationalists, which is actually not what happened, but you know that's how people right. talk about. I don't it. know if that's going to make it to the Super well, Bowl. Well, like he re, he well, it might not make it to the Super Bowl, <laughs> but he'll talk about unity, right? Well, yeah. like, what we would that be an ad unity. for? <laughs> Wrangler. <laughs> I'm not a sports right, guy, right. but I am a de- commercials guy, and so that's why I, I wanted to like tee up uh, since since this is coming out before Boomer the game. Moment for me, I miss the old E Trade Doritos and Terry Tate Office linebacker commercials. That was like those peak culture. I think I yeah. miss the fucking Waza. Well, those are real fun. Oh, like yeah. they yeah. did that again this year. They brought yeah, but it this sucked year. this year because it's new and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They should display old commercials. Uh, they should just play old commercials. There, there was there was one uh, there was one ad that oh no Geico that's it they just played a bunch of their old commercials for a while um, throughout the it was, it was it wasn't like this last year I think it was the 2019 season mm-hmm. and frankly it ruled uh, like and, the lizard never ages wow oh crazy <laughs> they played like the old caveman commercials remember they made that into a TV show too oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Nick Kroll with yeah. the. <laughs> 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 It really? was so stupid because they weren't cavemen. They didn't live in caves. Like they were just hairy. Like there's no a caveman <laughs> is someone who lives in a cave, right? That's what makes it. You're all saying it. 
We're all saying it. I don't What's know. What's the deal with these cavemen? <laughs> oh, yeah, house. I forgot that was originally a Super Bowl thing. Is the one yeah. where Mr. Peanut died, was that in the Super Bowl? I think Bowl? that was last year, yeah. 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 Was like, well, um, Baby Nut was revealed during the Super Bowl. Mr. Peanut died a couple of weeks beforehand. And the best part was, so he died, right? And then a real person died, which yeah. you would expect to happen in a society. <laughs> um, but that real person turned out to be Kobe Bryant. Right. And and so uh, Planters Peanuts had an apology tweet um, <laughs> apologizing for trivializing death by having their mascot die as a bit. Um, but they didn't, like, revive him. They just continued their commercial campaign, and they just said sorry. And then they united a bunch of brands for the Super Bowl to watch Baby Nut <laughs> uh, get get born, a, a baby get nut. reincarnate. Yeah. I, well, his name is, I think, canonically, insofar as there's a lore for Planters Peanuts, uh, Baby Nut. Yeah, it's really gross. It sounds yeah. like a baby. C- Heir cum. to the Nut Fortune. Yeah. Uh, so he's an adult now because it takes one year for a peanut to age into an adult, I guess. Uh, they yeah, also explained this on their Twitter. Why do I know this? <laughs> I don't know, but I also do this. I thought it was very Maybe funny. Maybe better be wearing a mask. That's all I can say. <laughs> I'm up in arms about this. But yeah, they had like all they had the Jolly Green Giant and Mr. Clean and a bunch of people like witness the reincarnation of Planters. And I think he died saving his friends. It, like I think they, the reason that it was like they had to say something about the Kobe. Bryant thing is because Kobe Bryant kind of died in not the exact same way, but like similar. Like he was in a helicopter. He was in a helicopter crash. The ba- Mister com- Peanut died they after were... his car careened off a cliff. I think it was like I think that yeah, it was either that or they eaten. were like mountain climbing or something. But it was just something with like with the mountain visually. Right. It was like too close. So but yeah, like so I think so he saved his friends because he was hanging off the the ledge, hanging off of his friends who were hanging off like the ledge or whatever. And they're like, we'll pull you up. And he's like, no. And he he lets go in order to save his friends. And uh, there's a huge explosion, which is very comedic because there was no reason for it to explode because he fell on a car or something like that. Mm. Also, there were wolves that are willing to eat them. But I <laughs> think the explosion killed him. Yeah. And to trivialize that. <laughs> also, he sexually <laughs> assaulted a minor in the, earlier in his life, and it was very controversial. <laughs> All right. Anyway, well. commercials, dude. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also that's a much better way to go out than the Bud Night. That's the last thing I'll say. <laughs> oh my god, I actually I know somebody who worked in that campaign. I would not stop bullying him. <laughs> He's like, I helped invent Bud Night, and I was like, You're, what's wrong with society? What the fuck is wrong with you, dude? I am Dilly Dilly. <laughs> All right, um, which part? Yeah, it's enough of this episode. <laughs> um. <laughs> Arif, where can our listeners find your work and follow you? Yeah, if you want more baby nut takes, you can follow me <laughs> at Arif Hassan NFL, A R I F H S A N NFL. Uh, and if you want to pay to get my takes, you can go over to the Athletic, theathletic.com slash author slash Arif dash Hassan. If you if you subscribe via one of my stories, I get credit for it, which is why I, I said my author page instead of just the athletic.com. Um, because if you subscribe, you might as well help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do it. Uh, yeah, so head over to The Athletic, and then I also have a, a politics podcast, The Wide Left Podcast. Um, we publish very inconsistently, but we do publish occasionally, so you listen to that too. Uh, and then I've got a football podcast, Norse Code. Oh, yeah. All right. Cool. Anybody else? At Andersley here on Twitter, Dursley on Instagram. Uh, on Friday, the 12th of February, uh, I don't know if you knew this, it's pronounced February. Um, I just, I think it should be anyway. I'm starting this trend to call it February. Uh, but Andy and I, the other end from Antifada will be doing a Twitch conversation sort of panel about our shared alma mater, the new school, uh, and the things we like and don't like about it, the way it has betrayed its radical roots. We're going to be talking to some other alma maters, Louisa, uh, Sean from Antifada, some other folks. So check that out. It'll be 6 30 uh, Eastern time on twitch.tv slash poddam America. I'm right. on Twitter at Patak Jokes, Balling Out Super, Theater of Delights. It that's that's what it is. Uh oh shows why you mad. Um yeah, all the same shit, Twitch and stuff. I wanted to also plug our friend Kenzo Shibata is raising money uh for 
Uh, Chicago teachers. Um, I'll plug the. I'll put it in the show notes. Save our returning educators, organized by Chicago teachers. Um, he's been hella podcasting and streaming in support of this. So I figured I would just try to help out today. And then also, um, I'm gonna play us out on something that's kind of cool, which is uh, a fucking friend of mine who's a comic who I just met while I was bartending a uh, like a, a, a bar that did comedy. Uh, is a, he just fucking made a, a really fucking tight mixtape. He's just a rapper now because COVID. He actually did something cool instead of doing stand up inside like a fucking psycho. Um, so yeah, my friend Thomas has a a mixtape out called the Filthy Poet mixtape under his rap name, which is Dolo Swope. And uh, I listened to it the other night, and I was like, holy shit, it's fucking tight. So I figured I'd play it on my little radio show. Enjoy. Black rays burst in the flame, started to end it. Black rays burst in the flame, started to end it. Black rays burst in the flame, started to end it. Black rays burst in the flames. Black rays burst in the flame, started to end it. Peace shatters, chaos in the street. Martin and Penny, carnal collisions, results of living loss and division. Screaming freedom, where was y'all in attendance? But now it's crawling, armed all through the city. A mockery of the democracy, you fought this a minute. I thought it diminished when officers got off of the killers. Make off with an arm for the pillage and a call for the lynching. But now it's blood on the Capitol steps. Blood on the Capitol steps. Blood on the Capitol steps. Funded a trailer, shredded papers, laid by where they move round numbers, number of PPEs on count. Do not cut it while tanks creep city streets. Curfew now covered, strapped down to the tooth. Ooh, who now want it? Riot gear to incite the fear. Yeah, move out, bust it, cover Brooklyn and tear gas. Still the youth not budget. All that money for defense, but how did you not budget to cover blood on the Capitol steps? Tape.